Hi, I'm Ian Queso, publisher of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Welcome to a new video series we're calling Winning STL, where I'll interview business and community leaders on their vision for how St. Louis can best compete and win in the battle for talent, jobs, growth, and equity. Today's segment is being filmed at the Sheraton Westport Chalet Hotel, a popular choice for hosting events and wedding receptions surrounded by over a dozen dining and entertainment options, including Westport Social. I'd also like to thank the Hartford Small Business Insurance, the presenting sponsor of Winning STL, for creating the financial opportunity to make this happen. My guest today is Tony Thompson. Tony is an engineer, a musician, a philanthropist, and the chairman and CEO of Kwame Building Group. Kwame, they are involved in about every big construction project uh, in St. Louis and around the country. That includes the new St. Louis City Park Soccer Stadium, the airport, Bush Stadium, any number of things. So with that, I'd like to welcome Tony Thompson. Tony, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So Tony, one thing I was not aware of until doing a, just a little bit of research for this discussion, Kwame, I didn't know what it meant, didn't know the background. Why don't you tell us? Well, you know, when I, uh, I, I created the company uh, called Kwame because it started kind of on the weekends. I would have guys who were laid off from McDonnell Douglas at the time. They would run projects for me during the day. They would bring it to me. And on the weekends, I would put together reports, estimates, schedules, and so forth. And so on Saturdays is when I would have meetings with my team members, and I would put the stuff together and give it to them to go on for the, for the following week. Thus, Kwame means born on Saturday. So the company was kind of born on Saturday. It's a Ghanaian a name, an African name. There you go. Interesting. Who yeah. knew? Nice. So, so, Tony, with all of these high-profile um, infrastructure construction jobs that you have been associated with, what's the one, I think, that stands out to you that you think is most impactful? That was probably the, uh, the $1.5 billion airport expansion that took place a few years ago. Sure. Where we, we added the additional runway. Uh, we uh, oversaw the construction of the new... Uh, the first thoroughfare tunnel in the state of Missouri underneath Lindbergh. Uh, and uh, we obviously built new fire station facility on, on the site. Mm -hmm. and so uh, that opened the door for us to be involved with other major airport expansions across the country. Uh, but the expertise comes into play when you're dealing with the FAA, for example. The FAA has circulars that they put out periodically where they're changing specifications all the time. You have to really stay up top, on top of that. Yeah, it is pretty much a specialty. Okay. You've got projects around the country, so I know you travel a lot. Um, is there anything that you've seen in other cities that you say, oh, St. Louis, we, we, we need to emulate this? Well, you know, when, when, when I go to those cities, we, we are, are, not that I'm not welcome at home, but there are, there are a lot of opportunities that we get in those other cities that really are not open to minority firms here. And sometimes when you're at home, people just perceive you as being one type a firm, a small minority firm, and I think that stands in the way sometimes of opportunity. Hmm, that's interesting. And you mentioned being a minority firm. I think, um, what, 80% of your staff are either uh, minorities or women, is that correct? That is correct. That is by design. And that's one of the things that I think you see in these other cities that most minorities and women feel are lacking in St. Louis. I know you've heard the story about brain drain. You heard the story mm -hmm. about a lot That's of right. African Americans who graduate and a lot of women who leave, uh, you know, some of our great institutions of learning here, and they go to other major cities. Why don't they stay here? Most of them, what I'm hearing, is that they don't feel that there's an opportunity for them to grow in St. Louis. So, Tony, both you and I are members of the Regional Business Council, and frequently when we're at those meetings, which are great, we'll hear really passionate speakers talking about the opportunity for St. Louis if we could unlock the potential of St. Louis's black community and the impact that can have on the region. I want to know, what do you think of that? Is that how you would frame it? What does that mean to you? How would we know if we're doing it? You know, that's a good question. So when you say unlock the potential, you know, then, then that's insinuating that they're locked <laughs> yeah. right now. So why are they locked? What, what's locking them up? And it's really just about the exposure. So if you don't know that these people exist, you know, you probably wouldn't tap into it. But sometimes you really have to seek them out. You know, it's like if you're really looking for very uh, talented uh, uh, young minorities and our women, where would you go? You're not gonna just walk through your door. Um, you know, some of the mentoring programs that I have, I bring some members from the RBC 
to the schools to speak to some of these young people. I didn't know what architect was until I was a junior in high school. I happened to like math and science. I was fortunate. But there are a lot of kids who were prepared to go to architecture school because they had been exposed to it. Sure. What role does the business community have collectively in doing this? And I think that, I think that gets to the how would it impact the region? And that's why it's exactly. in everyone's interest. But I think sometimes when you're looking with some of the major corporations here, they may not have enough minorities or women in the pool right. to begin with. I think the answer, what I'm hearing, is you have to go out and put a real focus, a concerted effort around how I recruit, where I go. I can't just do it the, the way I've done it for 20 years and expect a different result. It, exactly. You know, and it, it really it, and it starts at the top. We always hear that it starts at the top. Well, if the top doesn't have that as a priority, right. then it's not going to trickle down to other organizations. You know, I like to say in my organization, I have to inspect what I expect if I want respect. So let's say, Tony, maybe a lot of businesses aren't going to get to 80% uh, to a target like you have. But That's their any, problem. any kind of sizable <laughs> increase in that, what do you think the impact would be on St. Louis? What could that it, it, mean? Well, it would be huge. Let's well, just think about this. If the largest percentage of, of unemployed people in St. Louis are minority, and yet we're complaining about the economic growth opportunity in St. Louis, it would make sense to not just keep shuffling the same people around and moving them into various positions. We need to start employing more people who were not employed. But do they have a broader role to, um, to help get these outcomes for the entire region because it's, it's good for their customers, good for their employees, and possibly, and ho actually, definitely good for their business prospects? And I believe that we do. If these people get involved, these corporations get involved with the public schools, uh, some of the local universities, and they, and they kind of get engaged with some of the mentoring programs and, and career fairs and things like that so that these kids can see that there are other opportunities. So when people like Charles Barkley go and talk to these kids in some of these schools, they're not all saying they want to be uh, professional athletes because right. now they just met and Ian Kessel, they said, well, I, I want to be a publisher, you know, of a major newspaper, or I want to be an editor, you know, but they don't know. They don't know what that means. But all the people that they know that are so-called wealthy, that look like them, are entertainers and athletes. You'd be surprised how many times when I'm talking to kids and I, I come to the school and I talk to them and they, you know, they're asking me questions. They want to ask me, well, how much money do you make? Or what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> you know, all that stuff, you know. And so I tell them. I said, you know, you don't have to be an entertainer or an athlete. They don't know that. Right. Well, I think with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Tony, thank you so much for coming. Fascinating discussion, as usual, right. with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. All right. We'll come back next time and talk about nothing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs>